let's now examine the skeletal hind limb of the ruminant. Okay, so here we're looking at the ox. Start here at the pelvis. We've got the ilium. Back here, the ischium. And then the pubic bone is here. Okay, coming back to the ilium. This greater protrusion here is the tubercoxae. We've got the ileal crest. And then and then we have the tuber sacral. This region here is the wing of the ilium upon which the middle gluteal muscle predominantly sits. And we have the body of the ilium here. Okay, we're not going to be able to see the acetabulum real well on this specimen right now, but we'll look at that on an isolated specimen. Okay, we've got the greater ischiatic notch here and the lesser ischiatic notch. Just as in the horse, there's a fibrous sheath that fills in this area in here, creating a greater ischiatic foramen and a lesser ischiatic foramen. That is the sacrosciatic ligament. Okay? Coming through that greater ischiatic foramen is going to be the sciatic nerve, also the cranial gluteal artery and vein and nerve, as well as the caudal gluteal nerve. Okay? Through the lesser ischiatic foramen, so it's going to have a little hole here for that, there's going to be the tendon of the internal obturator coming down to attach in here. But also in the ox, we see the caudal gluteal artery and vein coming through the lesser ischiatic foramen. Okay? So, moving back to the ischium, we notice that the tuber ischii is very triangular here, okay, almost equilateral, and that's where much of the caudal thigh muscles are attaching. They're also going to have some attachment up on the sacrosciatic ligament, but not as much as we saw in the horse. Back here we have the ischiatic arch, and then here we can see the obturator foramen. Okay, then we have the pubis, which is right up in here, and if we come around this way, we can see the pubic tubercles here, the pectin of the pubis is here, and then we have our iliopubic eminence. Okay, so some important things to know about in the ruminant are the pelvic diameters. Okay, so we have the conjugate diameter, which is measured from the sacral promontory down to the pubis here. And then we have the transverse diameter from the wide part at one ilium to the other. Okay, so conjugate diameter, transverse diameter. These measurements are used in cattle to predict the size of calf that the cow can give birth to so that they can avoid dystocia. So here we have an isolated oscoxae. We've got the tubercoxae out here, tubercacral here. Between them it's kind of broken away is the ileal crest. We have the wing of the ilium, the body of the ilium, here once again is our greater ischiatic notch and our lesser ischiatic notch and in between them is the ischiatic spine. We come down here now and we see very nicely the acetabulum. The acetabulum has the articular surface, it has the acetabular notch and the acetabular fossa. So on that acetabular fossa is going to attach the ligament of the head of the femur. Okay, come back here looking at the ischium here, the tuber ischii, very triangular. Okay, and then our ischial arch. Then we have our obturator foramen. And of our pubic bone here, the pubic tubercle has been broken off, but we do see the pectin of the pubis 
and the iliopubic eminence. Okay. Up here is where the rectus femoris muscle attaches. And I think that's all for that. Looking now at the femur, we see proximally it does have a greater trochanter. Okay, has a caudal and a cranial aspect of that. We see the head more medially here in the acetabulum. Come back here caudally, and we see not just a greater trochanter, but a lesser trochanter. We have our intertrochanteric crest and our trochanteric fossa here. And we notice here that there is no third trochanter like we saw on the horse. Okay? That's important because remember in the ruminant we're going to have not a superficial gluteal and a biceps femoris but those are going to be fused together and we're going to call that the gluteal biceps. Okay? So we don't have a superficial gluteal to attach on the third trochanter. Okay? So we come down here to the distal part of the femur. We see a prominent trochlea with a very prominent medial trochlear ridge. Remember the trochlea is where the patella sits and moves. Okay, so we have down here the condyles. And this is the lateral condyle, lateral epicondyle. Let's come around caudally. And we see once again there's the lateral and the medial condyle, the intercondylar notch, up here is the popliteal surface, so our lateral epicondyle or medial epicondyle. We move up here a little bit higher, we see this fossa, so it's above the condyle, so that's the supracondylar fossa. That's where the tendon of origin of the superficial digital flexor muscle attaches. And it's not real obvious on this specimen, but right in here on either side, we should have the tubercles, the supracondylar tubercles, which is where the origin of the gastrocnemius muscle attaches. And if we come back cranially down in here, we're going to have an extensor fossa, just like we do in the horse. Notice it's aligning with that extensor groove. Attaching in that extensor fossa is going to be the pronius tertius muscle and the long digital extensor. So if we look now here at the femur, uh, proximally, here once again is the greater trochanter with a cranial and a caudal portion. We have the neck and the head of the femur. On the head of the femur, we have a fovea capitis, which is where the ligament of the head of the femur attaches which then attaches, remember, to the acetabular fossa to help keep that from disarticulating. We have caudally, we're looking at it, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter. Here's our intertrochanteric crest, our trochanteric fossa. And then if we move down distally, we've got the trochlea with a very prominent medial trochlear ridge. We've got the extensor fossa upon which the pronius tertius and the long digital extensor tendon attach. We have our two condyles, our lateral and our medial condyle, and likewise our lateral epicondyle and our medial epicondyle. Okay, between our condyles is the intercondylar notch. Here is the popliteal surface. And oh, we notice up here more proximally, so they are above the condyle, so these are, this is the supracondylar fossa upon which the superficial digital flexor tendon attaches. And on, on this side here and then back over here, we have the supracondylar tuberosities upon which the gastrocnemius muscle attaches. Okay. Let's now have a look at the tibia and fibula. You'll notice here that the head of the fibula is basically fused in this condylar area, this lateral condyle. Okay, so we don't see it here, but we do see an isolated 
lateral malleolus of the fibula here. Okay, so whereas in the horse the lateral malleolus was fused with the tibia and we had an isolated head of the fibula up here, it's opposite in the ruminant in that it's fused up here and isolated down here. Okay, come back up to this proximal portion. We see the extensor groove here through which the tendons of origin of the long digital extensor tendon and the pronius tertius come through. Okay, so our tibial tuberosity, that's where the quadriceps femoris muscle attaches. Then distally down here we have a medial malleolus of the tibia. We notice here that the fibula is greatly reduced as it was in the horse. So we do not see much of the head of the fibula here because it has fused to the tibia. Sometimes we see a little point of it coming down. Distally, remember it's down here as the lateral malleolus and here we can see the articulation for the lateral malleolus. Coming up here on the tibia proximally we have the condyles, the lateral medial condyle, the intercondylar eminence, we have the tibial tuberosity here upon which the quadriceps femoris muscle attaches. We have the extensor groove here for the long digital extensor tendon and pronius tertius. Back here we have a popliteal notch and we come down distally and once again there's our articulation for the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Here's our medial malleolus. We come here and we can see the cochlea which articulate with the talus. Notice they're not angular as they were in the horse. Okay, looking at the pest on this particular specimen, we have the calcaneus, the tuber calcanei. We have the talus. Notice that the talus has a trochlea proximal and a trochlea distal as well. Okay. Now this guy, we've got a lot of fusion of these bones down here. In the ruminant, there's going to be the fourth and central tarsal bone fused, then the second and third, and then around medially is going to be the first tarsal bone right here. But this one is quite fused, so we'll have to look at an isolated specimen to have a better look at that. Okay. So then distal to that, we have the metatarsals, the fused third and fourth metatarsal bones, and then we have our digits three and four, so the medial one is going to be digit three, the lateral one digit four. They both have a proximal, uh, middle, and a distal phalanx. Okay, we see the extensor process on the distal phalanx. We come around here caudally, we see a little bone up here. This is sometimes called metatarsal 2 or the metatarsal sesamoid bone because it's going to be within the tendon of the, the inner osseous muscle. Come down here, we've got, okay, we're missing one of our proximal sesamoid bones here, but we've got basically two pairs down here and our proximal sesamoid bones, distal sesamoid bone down here at our distal interphalangeal joint. So we'll have a better look at those when we look at the isolated specimen. So let's now have a look at the pests on the isolated specimen. So we see here once again the tibia and the lateral malleolus of the fibula. So that's lateral malleolus fibula, medial malleolus of tibia. Okay, now at the pests we've got the calcaneus bone with the tuber calcanei. Over here is the sustentaculum talli over which the deep digital flexor tendon passes. We look at the talus here. 
we notice that the talus has two trochlea, okay, both a proximal and a distal one. It's seen rather nicely here, kind of that roundedness, okay. Now, commonly in the ruminant, we have a fourth and central tarsal bone fused, and we also have the second and third tarsal bone fused. So just as the second and third carpal bone were fused, we have fusion of the second and third tarsal bone as well. And then here is the first tarsal bone, okay? So I have fused central and fourth, fused second and third, and a first tarsal bone, okay? We look now at the metatarsal bones. We have a fused third and fourth metatarsal bone, just like we had a fused third and fourth metacarpal bone. Okay, on the caudal aspect, we have this little bone here, which is the metacarpal bone number two, or sometimes called the metacarpal sesamoid because it's within the tendon of the interosseous muscle. On this dorsal surface, we see a vascular groove here. Down here is a vascular foramen, distal vascular foramen. And then we have two heads. Okay, so we have an intercapital fissure between the two heads. Each head goes to each digit. Okay, so we have a medial and a lateral digit or digit three and digit four. Digits are composed of proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. Okay, and we see here the extensor process on the distal phalanx. We come around here caudally and we see our proximal sesamoid bones. There's going to be both an axial and abaxial for each digit. Okay. And then our distal sesamoid bones are down here at the distal interphalangeal joint. And then we have our flexor tubercles on our distal phalanx. Okay, let's quickly look at the distal joints in the hind limb of the ruminant. So here we have our tarsal crural joint where our tibia and fibula are articulating with the talus, which is the most mobile of these joints. So this would then be our proximal intertarsal joint. And then our distal intertarsal joint is here. And then our tarsal metatarsal joint is here. Okay, these two are going to communicate all the time as well as these two. Okay, we move down to the digits and we've got the metatarsal phalangeal joint and just like in the front limb, the joints on each digit communicate with each other. Okay, so this joint communicates with this joint. Whereas our proximal interphalangeal and our distal interphalangeal, they're not going to communicate from one digit to the other. Okay. When we do a digit amputation, we don't want to cut up here at the metatarsal phalangeal joint because those communicate. So we want to come down here into the first phalanx and we want to do it at an angle so that it's not hanging up on stuff, but also so that we get the vascular supply to this segment of bone is still intact. Okay?